Well, welcome to Jim Chambers from Tim Moyer Associates. Jim, so good to see you. Could you just tell people a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, Sharon. Uh, uh, Jim Chambers, as you say, aka James Chambers. I've, I'm a principal art consultant at TMA. Uh, I've been in this business for too long, uh, over over 20 years now, and I was previously uh, urban forest manager at Islington Council for well for a few years, but I worked there in total for about 13 years before I came over to Tim Moyers. So we deal with mainly risk, well, only risk condition, uh, specialist investigation, that kind of thing. Interesting. Excellent. And we saw each other at the ARP conference. It was fabulous, wasn't it? Did you have it a good was. time? I really enjoyed it. Yes, it was great. Really enjoyable conference. I was quite intrigued by it. In all honesty, I wasn't necessarily grabbed by the title when it first came out, but I'm very glad I went because it was probably the best conference I've been to. I agree. It was it was really the best conference I've been to with yeah. the AA. Really, I've really good. I've heard several people say that actually. It was really, yeah. really interesting. There was it was very high pace. I found it very, very intense. There was lots going on all the time and uh not a minute to sit down really it was great really um, interesting and we were both at the field trip on sunday that where we walked fantastic. on cork abbey yeah, and uh whilst we were there you were talking about fungi on a london plane and you said something that i hadn't heard before i said it's a word of the week jim what was our word of the week it's two words it's neo fusicocum parvum yeah i'll say it again neo fusicocum parvum Wow, that's brilliant. What is it and why does it matter? It's a fungus and uh, I'd never heard of it either until a few years ago now. Um, I was surveying some trees, uh, some plane trees, and I noted some lesions. I can show you a picture in a moment. Just small lesions on the... I didn't, didn't really um, enter my mind at all. I noted them because they were there, but there was no significance that I was aware of. Uh, at some point, I don't remember when that was, it must have been 2016, I think. And um, at some point following that, one of the trees that had these two sort of small lesions started to suffer physiologically. And so when I was asked to go and have another look at it, uh, I, I kind of considered that again. It was obvious to me that this wasn't in any way canker pain because the lesions look nothing like the what we've seen. Not that I've ever seen that in real life, but uh, the the images we were, we'd been shared uh, have been shared with us about canker stain. But I decided to take a sample using a uh, increment borer um, and send it off to Forest Research. And lo and behold, that's the first time I ever heard of Neofusicocum parvum because that was a, a, a fungus that was present in the sample I sent. That was that was isolated by Dr. Ana Perez Sierra at Forest Research. I don't think she'd heard of it until that point either. Um, but she did when she when she let me know that that's what she'd found. She also sent me a paper from uh, Geneva. Um, where um, some uh, ARBs in, in that country had found some planes which were all dying um, and they assumed that it was probably canker stain. So they tested each, I think it was six trees, they tested six of the trees and off the top of my head, four of them had no canker stain, but two of them did. They were in, I, think, I don't think they were even together. Anyway, uh, eventually all six of the trees died uh, and had to be removed and um, the four that didn't have canker stain, they, they tested them more thoroughly and found, among a few other things, Neofusicocum parvum in those trees. Uh, they then did further tests using um, inoculating small trees in, you know, deliberately to see what happened and determined that N parvum, or plain canker as, as it's now been called, is uh, pathogenic on plain trees. So um, going back to the frog tree I found it on, that tree was a very large tree in central London. It was it was protected, uh, and it declined very rapidly over the um, over well shortly after this initial decline. Um, and physiologically, there was also some decay, which, which may have been due to in a notice. But we thought it probably was, but there was we hadn't seen any fruit bodies, so we didn't know exactly what was happening. The tree right next to it, I should have mentioned, I sampled that as well, and that also has N parvum. However, that tree is still there. And it's and uh, as of the last time I saw it, it was fine. Um, it had some had these lesions. So, Jim, we're now recording this on video as well, so yeah. listeners can go to our YouTube channel as well okay. as listening on all of the podcast platforms. So, Jim, what does this fungus look like? I don't know. 
Uh, it's uh, it's uh, microscopic and uh, doesn't produce fruit bodies in the same way as uh, in Inotus or Ganoderma, for example. So the indicator that I am aware of and, and the, the call sign of it, if you like, the thing to look out for, are vertical lesions with callus growth, which can appear um, pretty much anywhere on the stem. Of, uh, of the plane tree or on large branches, sometimes on the underside or on the side. There doesn't seem to be any pattern I've uh, identified yet as to why or where these lesions appear, but they are, Anna and I are absolutely convinced that they are the key indicator uh, to give you a clue that there's something going on. The interesting thing, or there's a whole load, host of interesting things about it, is, as I mentioned, the, uh, there were two trees that I found it on initially. Both the first two trees I tested had it. At some point later, uh, I can't remember exactly. I've got this all detailed somewhere, but let's say a year later, um, lesions appeared in most of the other plane trees in the same garden. And so as part of the investigation that we've been, we, Anna and I have been doing since 2017, I think, we got a MUP and tested all of these lesions. The first lesions were were accessible from ground level, but all of the secondary batch that I noticed were way up in the crown, 20 meters plus. Um, so we got a mupe in and tested every single one of those lesions, sterilizing all the equipment in between as, as always on, on the same day in exactly the same way that we tested the first two. And Anna took those samples away and tested all of those samples in exactly the same way. And all of them came back negative. Now, again, more questions than answers. No idea how or why that happened. Um, since first isolating the original uh, sample, I have noticed these kinds of lesions all over the place on plane trees, pretty much everywhere. Not literally everywhere, but pretty much everywhere. They are commonplace in plane trees in London, and that's an interesting factor. So I was concerned because the conclusion of the report I mentioned earlier from Geneva said that while it didn't say the trees died because of M. Harvin, it said that they had, it had evidence that there may be another fungus which acts in a similar way to canker stain um but it's all again it's all a bit vague and there are a lot of questions more questions than answers really so so this pathogenic uh fungi which which was, was previously known on grapevines apparently has uh evolved if you like to now be pathogenic on plane trees and we asked we, um, we've had one plane tree which had it and also was physiologically severely affected but the, as I mentioned already, I've seen it on many, many other plane trees across London, and I've not noticed any others so far that have been so badly affected, even though the lesions are identical. Uh, there does seem to be, in some cases, some exudates, mild, minor exudates from those lesions. Not all the time. That seems to be a, a process that isn't continuous. And um, the interesting thing, as I mentioned, with the, the first place I found it, those the latter lesions that appeared after the first ones, which were there before I'd ever been to that site, so I don't know how long they've been present, but the, the latter lesions which appeared during the time I've been aware of the fungus and the trees, we could not isolate that fungus in those trees. And again, there's no real explanation for that. But when they, when they determined it was pathogenic on the planes in, the, in a lab um, laboratory conditions, it's these lesions that it that were produced even on very young trees so um there's something going on but there are more questions than answers well i'm going to try with a couple of questions so the first symptom that presented to you before you started looking for lesions were the leaves wilting did they suddenly no. wilt no it was the other way around it, I, I noted the lesion just purely because it was present and and then and then later on yes the, the, the it was a it was a vascular wilt is if it, to the best of our understanding so yes the crown wilted significantly and be, particularly because it was right next to another tree of the same species it was really apparent really obvious and um because this tree at this stage bear in mind we didn't really know anything about the fungus or how it worked um, and this tree also had some um, decay in some really obvious decay in um, scaffold limbs in the crown, which again, you'd think probably would be something to do with the notice not being a plane tree and that kind of thing. But I hadn't seen any fruit bodies of anything else. So we, so we were considering that. Then we had um, a, a kind of a, a sunken strip. And I do have some images I can share another time of, um, of a sunken vertical strip in the upper uh, stem which led all the way up. You could, it wasn't unbroken, but you could see a, a path between the lesion that I could see at, let's say, a metre 
above ground level the original lesion that i saw and it was kind of it weaved its way up the stem and um so during the period in which it was really suffering physiologically it, it, it was a clear sunken area in the stem and uh then epicormic shoots were produced in that area and then those epicormic shoots died which was very surprising what we're going to do listeners is jim is going to send me the photographs by email and noel's going to edit them in at various points in this talk so if you watch this on youtube you'll be able to see what he's describing um so uh, sounds really interesting and worrying because london plains are just one of our survivors in city environments they're known to be tolerant for uh, root pruning, shoot pruning, often managed as pollards. They give that massive canopy cover that's so important in cities. They're really good at pollution mitigation and they're part of the sort of city cityscape character as well. So the loss of our planes will be devastating. So it's really for this disease, which I still can't say, it's watch this space and it's a plain canker I can say plain canker, folks. Jim, can you tell us anything else about this disease, please? Yeah, yes, it's, uh, there's something going on. Um, as, as, as you've gathered from what I've been saying, I've been, I've been gathering and collating evidence, trying to test every tree I can find without bothering with the mupes anymore, given that, you know, the difficulties I had getting the mupe and, and the client had to pay for all of that. And in the end, we, we didn't find anything out. So I've just been trying to locate trees where it's reachable from ground. And I've continually tested trees in that situation and found several more across London, which have it confirmed. I've also talked to some of my other clients who are dealing with lots of plane trees, that, you know, what it is. And when we found it in several locations, it's confirmed. The other thing that's interesting is, that, of course, we've also found lots of situations where the lesions are present and we've tested them and still had negative results. And we still have no explanation for that because the lesions look the same. In one instance, there's a lesion which I, which has been there for, since long before I looked at the tree and which I'm told by the gardener who has worked at the estate for over 40 years, it was there when he started there. So it's not a new thing. Uh, and in, in other cases, something that's more, perhaps even more interesting is Earlier this year, the beginning of this year, before uh, trees came into leaf, uh, there were an absolute host of trees that suddenly developed all these lesions wow. um, uh, in, in, in close proximity to each other in central London. And since then, I've seen, uh, I've noted with another colleague, uh, a new a new form of this. Well, I say, let me take that back. I've noticed lesions which look identical forming in trees which had no lesions previously with an elongated uh, oval, for want of a better term, strip of um, the lightest sort of grey bark with plane trees. Mm. So we all know planes shed bark, but they get down to the really light grey layer and it's clearly defined around the lesion, so which again suggests it's vascular. And additionally, in several cases, multiple lesions in not directly, uh, you know, straight line, but clearly linked uh, in a vertical path. And that's been this year. Now, because most of those, in fact, all of those pretty much have been quite high in the crown, I haven't yet been able to take samples and confirm that that's definitely N. parvum, but it does seem very likely given the, you know, the identical nature of the lesions, even though the uh, gray strip has been less consistent in the past. It's not, it's not always been there, although it has in some occasions. And I've seen plenty of trees, which I've previously seen lesions in, now have many more lesions. And so uh, something is changing and I have no real, nothing other than a guess about why or what that is. But the other interesting thing is that we still haven't determined any um, cause or any, any consequence of this, of this other than the lesions themselves. Uh, and one other couple of, couple of things are right, once I've Googled um, Neofusicocum barvum online, um, I've recently found that not only has it affect, did it come from uh, grapevines, but it has affected other trees including oriental plains uh, eucalyptus in various countries and perhaps strangest of all quite recently in another report from geneva where the original report we read came from it's it's been found to be uh, affecting sequoia dendrum giganteum which wow, is that's a leap that you totally. wouldn't think of because you could think yeah oriental plain mm. yeah eucalyptus 
Hmm. Maybe. Well, yeah. Another one with flaky bark, maybe. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It's rather a sort of silly thing to say, but... Uh, yeah, I can get that link there. Yeah, but, yeah, but... The that's, that's, that's insane, so we, isn't it? We need to know if it matters. Um, you, you told about... You said about the first tree that wilted. Yeah. I mean, could that have been another cause? Well, it's not impossible. We can't rule that out. So, so when the tree was taken down, I, I was on site and took loads of samples and loads of photos. I can show that the, there was the cambium death around a good section of the of the circumference. Um, I took samples in the same way that I'd taken them previously uh, into various discoloured wood. There were other fungi in there, uh, fusarium, which I understand is quite a common soil fungi and it's quite present in trees. But the but the the end parvum was present in lots of the clearly uh, affected areas and so i think it's quite likely based on the previous evidence from uh, geneva and what we found there that that end problem was certainly a factor if not the actual cause and we weren't able to isolate anything else that we would be aware of that could have, could have had such a cause so or could have had such a consequence so it's definitely a, a something to be aware of and the reason we haven't really announced anything so far is because it's more questions than answers but it's really about you know it's been overdue we've been, we've been wanting to let people know about what to look for because that then perhaps between us with, with a greater pool of, of people looking into it we might find out something sooner but it's a it's a tricky one talking about a greater pool listeners do check out the youtube channel see the images and if you could contact noel at treeladytalks.co.uk if you too have seen this and we'll pass it on to Jim and Jim will pass it on to maybe Alice Holt and then we can start building up a database or something else that you're curious about with London Plains. Well let's talk about that now. I mean the one that a lot of our listeners who work in the profession will be aware of is Masaria. Um, perhaps you could just describe the basics of, for those who, who may be starting out in their career or, or maybe don't work every day with trees, let's go back to basics of Masaria. What does it look like and what does it do? Okay, Masaria is another fungus that affects uh, plane trees, uh, uh, Splanchnonema platani. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know when it was actually first discovered, I believe it was in the mid noughties and at the time I was working in Islington and we found it on a tree. Um, we, we, we took, there was a tree with a branch that failed for no obvious reason. It, well, it was obvious why it had failed, but we weren't sure how the, it got into that condition. Um, basically, it's a, a fungus that um, works its way inside the tree, into the branches, decays, forms a soft rot decay on the top of the branch, which means it's obviously quite difficult to see from the ground. And which, as that de decay develops, uh, obviously, the tension in the branch is, is, is damaged, and so the branch tends to fail, sometimes hanging from the lower section of the branch, which might still be intact, sometimes falling completely. Uh, there are theories about it being um, a natural uh, branch shedding uh, tool for the tree, if you like, which is which is developed and is slightly more aggressive for some reason. Not, I'm just not really, that's a bit out of my area of expertise to say whether that's the case. It may be latent in the trees, again, that does appear that way. But the problem, the big problem for tree managers and for the trees is the fact that it causes branch failure quite quickly. So um, that we, we worked with the um, London Tree Officers Association to produce a, uh, with, with a team of other tree officers who produced the Masaria document, which I would strongly advise you have a look at that if you don't know what it is, because that's, it's freely available at the LTOA website. It's a very good document. It's got lots of great information in there. And it describes the fact that you that you tend to see this sort of cinnamon, light brown discoloration, bark loss along the top part of the branch, which is, again, not something that's unusual on a plane tree anyway, so it's not easy to, to spot. But once you get your eye in, it is possible to see it from the ground. The big problem with this area, as I say, is, is, the, is the potential branch failure and the combination with Masaria and Inonotus, which you may, uh, listeners may well be aware of already, Inonotus hispidus, which is a fungus which does causes great decay on ash trees, but much less so in plane trees because they're able to compartmentalize decay better. But um, Inonotus tends to hollow out the the, in, the middle of the branch, and with uh, 
mesaria damaging the top of the branch, you can get some very large stems failing. I remember some years back I had a very large stem, must have been 25 centimetres or more across at the base. Um, and it was an upright stem. Uh, there was no indication of inner or mesaria. It was in full leaf and it just fell off one day into a into a private garden fortunately there was no one there but it was a you know it was quite clear that masaria had worked on what was effectively the top side even though it was almost vertical um and and it had already been hollowed out presumably by in notice but they weren't it just hadn't produced any fruit bodies that we had, we had ever seen and there wasn't any obvious decay from the ground but a, a huge a huge stem basically fell out of the tree into into onto the ground just like that and it was in the fall leaf so the combination of those two things can be a real problem and so when I've seen branches that have fallen from Bessaria, I've, I've often seen this characteristic V-shaped wedge That's right. on the top, which is a cinnamon colour. Yes. Um, it's not always like that, of course. No. Um, before we go on to talk about inner notice hispidus, this creates a real problem because as we, as we spoke about earlier about London Plains often being in city environments, yes. next to busy roads, footpaths, people's houses, commercial buildings. The tolerance of risk, the tolerance of branch failure is, is very low. So it's really resulted in a sort of high level inspection regime by a lot of right. local authorities who own trees or large scale tree managers. Um, and, and you could sort of see, can't you, often the tree is the leaf. Oh my God. You can see, can't you, that the branch is kind of dying from the ground yes. often. Yes. But not That's always. True. That's right. Um, yeah. I mean, have you. In your experience as a local authority officer and now managing large-scale tree populations in private practice, have you ever had sort of pressure to remove the tree in advance because it might develop massaria or it's lost a branch? Has it led to like whole tree felling? No, it, no, definitely not. Although it, I, off my head, I'd have to think about whether anyone had initially suggested that. But again, that would be inappropriate. Um, and, and and also would be very unlikely to be successful in the central London situation where, where many of these trees are protected. But we would obviously discourage that in any case because it's not it's not the solution. Although that said, I have seen plane trees in uh, areas where I don't I don't manage them, but where they are in very poor condition. There's several sites I can think of off the top of my head in East London where um, they've not had branches removed, but the Masaria affected branches removed. And to be fair, sometimes, we don't know why, they still stay there, even if they are decayed and dead, even completely dead. They, they do hold on. It's just one of those very unpredictable things. But what I've noticed, and, it, and again, this is not scientific, that, that um, sometimes with trees that aren't managed and don't have the branches removed, the Masaria seems to spread. And so you end up with in almost entirely dead stems and further more, you know, more dead stems following on from one another and so you can end up with situations where because when you do in, do go in and remove those stems there's not much left you are seeing I mean these are, these are smaller trees than the initial ones I've talked about in central London but where you're removing a significant area of the crown because it's become colonized and dead or decayed through Masuria colonization then you can end up with trees which probably the best thing to do is remove them which is which will be a problem. So it, so it does depend on a variety of circumstances. Again, Masaria we think is water related. There's there's good theories about it um, being water related um, in in the way that I mentioned earlier how it might have um, evolved, if you like, from the tree's own ability to just shut, shut off smaller branches and drop those as part of its natural physiological process. So. What we noted, uh, again, mostly anecdotally, we don't have scientific data on this, but years years ago when we were first um, coming to terms with this problem and finding management options to deal with it, which didn't involve just felling all the plane trees, uh, we, we noticed that after a drought year, the following year, we would see more Masaria branches present in the crown, more affected and, and damaged and decayed and dead branches in the crown than in the previous year. To be fair, I think that's less clear nowadays. That was that that seemed to happen several times running where there was a drought year. The following year it was worse. Perhaps it's to do with the continually rising temperatures, and you know it's, it's a bit of a vague idea. I don't really know how we can determine that more now. But but the 
it's it's less defi well defined now. We're seeing in some cases there are several people I know who who look at plane trees every year. So every year we have a sort of a chat together. How's it looking this year? You know, there are trees that we manage annually, and there are trees that are owned by local authorities, which are obviously managed at least an annually and inspected regularly. So we often compare notes about the prevalence of dead mosaria branches, generally speaking, each year. And you know they do tend to coincide from one area to another, so it may not be a, a localized uh, water issue. It may be more of a general kind of climate issue. But again, these are all just theories at the moment. There's no no detailed science on that. Well, um, yes, of course, they're just theories at the moment. Everything needs to be rigorously tested. But we do know that we've had a real problem with um, sooty bark disease in with sycamore on a hot, dry year. That's true. Which is it endemic within the sycamore trees. That's Cryptostroma cortical, folks. I remembered that one. <laughs> and so, you know, we've seen real incidences of that um, with hot, dry summers in cities where water is harder to get. And similarly, another endemic one um, is... I remembered it um, <laughs> on silver birches, which again is endemic yes. within the tree and it's That's triggered right. by drought stress. Could it be... And this is just my fanciful theory. You don't have to answer this. Could it be that uh, Masaria is now endemic within London Plains and it's yes. triggered? Yes, it could. Uh, and again, I'm not equipped to answer that conclusively. But yes, I think it very much could. And that was a theory we were working on for some time. Well, we, we were assuming that theory to some extent um, because it's in pretty much every plane tree. And so many many even trees that haven't been pruned it does affect younger trees to a lesser extent generally speaking but it does affect them interestingly enough i've seen neophysico comparvum lesions in young plane trees which haven't been pruned either so so it may be that both of them are endemic we just don't know but those are both they're both perfectly reasonable theories as to, to the best of my knowledge okay and we've spoken also about inonotus hispidus which is a fungus which is on, uh, on lots of different hosts Yes. You said earlier, ash, apple, all trees. There, there, on, you know, all sorts of other trees. Yes, yeah. and it, it's um, one that I actually know something about, folks. Surprisingly, and I can say it as well. <laughs> but it, it in the spring it comes out. It's sort of like a shaggy chamois leather, a sort of orangey right. chamois leather that's kind of like folded over. And as the season passes, it gets very black and it sort of decays and then it often breaks up and you can see them on the ground right. and you get your eye, your inner notice eye in yeah. and then you can see them and on ash trees it forms these really obvious lesions going down we've often then woodpeckers get in there and get these masses of holes in there and of course it's fantastic habitat if it's in the middle of a field or in the middle of a wood and nobody's walking yeah. by but often it isn't and it then it subsequently leads to loss of vitality in the crown but in london plain you said earlier about it, it the tree is best able to cope with it and it's not generally a massive issue um, that's true it hasn't been anyway until until this kind of mm -hmm. combination problem with um uh, masaria so i've seen lots of plane trees i'm sure you have as well with with um smaller inner notice holes mm. and leaves with woodpecker holes often associated but as, as we've seen in many cases, it tends to hollow out a, a branch or, or a part of the stem, but leave the circumference largely intact. And because planes really strong wood as well, it, it's it's far less common for it to cause um, failures or structural damage in that way. But as I mentioned earlier, with the with the hollowing of the middle, if you've got a a, a branch where the tension side, whether that be the top or you know at, at an angle, is being decayed with the soft rot of um, Masaria, then you have a problem because, or potentially, because all the weight is on the uh, compression side and you can see the branches fur. That's happened in a lot of times, a lot of cases. And so that's another issue with Masaria, where you can see the smaller branches because they might be discolored or perhaps even partially failed and hanging on. And so you can spot those quite easily. It's really important when you're doing a Masaria inspection to view the tree from all 360 degrees because and and ideally with binoculars as well to look into the higher parts of the tree depending on the size because it is possible to see uh, the beginnings of lesions or the beginnings of damage on the top part of the branch but it's also quite miscible so you have to come to a conclusion some parties will um you know who have 
unlimited or close to unlimited resources may choose to climb the trees three times a year. That's the other in interesting thing we discovered that but when the first tree we discovered it on, I mentioned uh, way back when we sent the sample and confirmed it was Mercaria, the branch failed, so we sent the sample in, and within four months, there were other branches in the tree which were also at the point of failure, which are dead and clearly no, no longer attached properly. And so it can um, affect branches in a relatively short time frame and render them uh, you know, potentially uh, liable to fail. Although, as we've also said on some occasions, branches can stay in the crown for years. It really depends where the tree is and what the target area is as to how often you need to consider uh, the problem. Several things came out of that for me. The first thing um, which you said was often you've got multiple diseases in a tree. So yeah. something like inner notice which would normally be fairly well tolerated in plain tree, you get another agent in and then the tree becomes decline, it may be stress because of climatic conditions. Such parallels of human health, you get one disease, you have flu and then you pick up cold sores, you know, any any sort of combination of factors. And yeah. also the other thing you said, you've really got to look at the whole tree. That's and that's right. the way that modern medicine is moving now, thank goodness, a holistic look at the whole person. Yeah. And and also about the stressful events of, of climate change, which is definitely happening. And that is that is loading the tree's system with stress as it's having to adapt to survive in different situations just the same way as human health um, right. all of this sounds rather alarming so we're talking about science we're talking about diseases here but it's about the value of the trees and the acceptance of risk yes so there are many ways of valuing trees it's often um, using something called a cabat value um, which again, if listeners aren't familiar with that, they can go on to the London Tree Officers Association website, LTOA, resources, and as well as looking at the Masaria document, they can look at CAVAT. So using that system, some of these London plane trees are worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. Right. They're greatly valued, and then we're looking at, at ecosystem services, we're looking at how much canopy they cover. They are really worthwhile spending these resources on and i think there just has to be an acknowledgement by the landowner by the tree manager that they've got to invest in this because um it's unacceptable to remove a tree unless it's completely going to fail or or it poses an unacceptable risk to health and safety that's right jim do you think there's anything that we can do other than vigilance inspection reporting and understanding disease and disseminating that information. Is there anything that we can do to the tree in the way that we do with people? You've got to have good nutrition, you've got to make sure you rest. What are your thoughts on increasing the tree's vitality either with something like biochar or fertilizers or decompaction, mulching? Do you think that might have a part to play increasingly in the future as our trees become more stressed? In principle, yes, um, because uh, if you have a tree in your garden, for example, uh, you may be able to control um, factors regarding its vitality, for example, mulching in that area. But um, if it's a tree in a municipal park or a tree in the street, for example, I think there's going to be very limited options to try and mm. increase vitality. One thing that's always important, as I, as I know you know, is is supporting and, and uh, uh, preparing for uh, young trees, making sure they are properly established by giving them the best chance, the best start they can, and that's the best way to help them in the future. The problem we have is that um, streets are not kind of natural environments for trees anyway, so they're already on the back foot to some extent with the you know the pollution which again as you point out plane trees are very good at, at coping with that but I, I assume it must be having some sort of negative effect on some level and if the trees as you've just touched upon if the trees are affected by one thing they may not be so able to cope with yet another and another and, and a, another sort of slightly uh, potentially depressing way to look at it is is with comparison with horse chestnut trees which uh, are also affected by numerous problems at the moment and have been for some years. Uh, so you've got bleeding canker and leaf miner and, and leaf blotch, for example. All three of those problems are very common among 
um, chestnut trees, which seem to continue to bounce back year after year. But you've got to assume that at some point there's going to be a turning point. And what what um, I think is important to consider with plane trees is that, as we, as we sort of touched on earlier, they are they've always con been considered sort of indestructible. Um, you know, real real soldier trees, real real bomb proof trees mm. that, that kind of grow through anything, and yet. We're aware of canker stain, which we haven't really discussed, but it's not here, thankfully. Um, uh, Splank, no, that's not Splank Manima, it's uh, Serrata cystis patani, uh, which is... I was just about to say that, Jim. You beat that, me to you it. You were, weren't you? I knew it. I could <laughs> see it. Um, so, so that one has... Uh, there have been uh, thousands upon thousands of, of plane trees removed in other parts of Europe, uh, in France mm. and um, in Italy, where they were, they were colonised by that fungus, which is... To the best of my broad understanding is is um, a, another vascular problem which is quite a bit more aggressive and very easily transmitted through uh, human behavior through you know the scuff mark against the bark is the is the most common word so you might just knock the tree with a uh, a passing i don't know dust cart or something and that opens up uh, the vascular uh, tissue and then the the fungal spores get in there and the tree is very quickly colonized and can die I think it can take up to a few years for it to die, but it will start to um, become dysfunctional very, relatively quickly. And as I said, because it's such an easy one to spread, there, there have been practices where you have to remove the playing trees very quickly and remove the tree either side of it as well, which is quite, quite extreme, sounds really extreme, and it obviously is. That isn't here, to the best of our knowledge, but it could get here, and let's face it, things have got here in the past. It's not It's not unlikely that it will get here at some point. And if we have something like that, as well as all the things we've already got, you can only imagine it would be like Dutch elm disease all over again before our time. But Dutch uh, elms used to be, yeah, elms used to be the biggest trees in the country, and there were millions of them. And then a few years later, there were none, or very, very few. And and that potentially is a situation that could occur again with with plane trees in the worst case scenario. If one of the things we're all learning is that we need diversity in our tree population Absolutely. to make it sustainable. And whilst nobody wants to see a large scale loss of any one species and obviously struggling with ash at the moment, yeah. that's serious. If there's ever a silver lining and it's a tiny one, we will have the opportunity to plant hopefully climate tolerant, wide range of different species. It may be gone of the avenues of single species in the future. And there's much debate about the aesthetics of that, but I think we're all learning that we need to look more broadly at tree planting. I mean, there's an excellent spreadsheet on TDAG, that's T-D-A-G, if you go to their website and look at resources, there is a tree selection list. It's absolutely fantastic uh, uh, resource, uh, freely available, uh, we use it all the time, and I couldn't agree with you more, Sharon, actually, the most important thing is to increase diversity. Uh, and particularly to plant trees, trees which are more uh, tolerant from their, their host countries, more tolerant to the increasing temperature and drought conditions, for example, um, that we are experiencing more as climate change continues. And so w one thing we, we do, whenever we re recommend the removal of a tree for whatever reason, we're always recommending a replacement and we'll always recommend a, a, an exotic which is suit suitable for the conditions we expect to be occurring in, in uh, as already and in the next few years. So you're right, there is that silver lining. The, the, one of the questions to think consider there is, is, for example, with plane trees, there isn't anything like a plane tree. Um, you know, there are trees which have similar leaves, but there's nothing quite like a plane tree, really. So how do you replace a plane? What can you put in instead? I don't know. But one of the things we suggest is, is pines. We don't have enough con conifers. They are underrepresented and they they provide a great deal of, of uh, ecosystem services, which are I think they're underrepresented and perhaps not fully uh, appreciated in that respect. I agree. I love a, I love a pine. Great big air scrubbers, evergreen, yeah, yeah. lots of good stuff going on there. Jim, we could chat for hours and hours. I'm so grateful for your time. Pleasure. Um, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I really look forward to ongoing research on this. Again, yes. listeners, we want to hear your plane stories. So it's noel, N-O-E-L, at treeladytalks.co.uk. 
let's watch our beautiful planes and do everything we can and keep cheerful. They're not dropping down like flies. You know, we've uh, talked sure. about disease. There's plenty of healthy planes around. So, um, Jim, thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. And thank you, Dale.